To all the families and friends here, congratulations. It's so lovely to have the good fortune of witnessing your loved one graduate from the best law school in the country. And to you, Yale Law Class of 2022, congratulations. I know it's been a bit of a difficult time for you, COVID and all, so congratulations. And thank you so much for having me as your speaker. I was happy to know that the extraordinary Dwayne Betts was speaker for last year's class, and I'm grateful to be in such good company. It's also an honor to follow James Silk, who is such a wonderful example of how brilliance and humanity can seamlessly coexist. So I was going to start by telling you not to make any of your life's choices based on what is prestigious, but rather based on infinitely more noble reasons. And then I asked myself why I had said yes to giving this commencement speech. <laughs> if not that being asked to speak at Yale Law School is prestigious. So please do consider prestige <laughs> when making your life choices, but it helps if there are other reasons. In addition to feeling deeply honored and flattered to be asked, I said yes for another reason, which is that I'm a fiction writer always hungry for material, always alert and watching, hawk-like, for what I can use in my stories. As a child, I sharpened very early on the skill of eavesdropping, a pastime at which I'm still quite adept. So watch out for my next novel, and for a character who maybe graduates from Yale Law School, or teaches at Yale Law School, and yes, it would be based on you. <laughs> but there was yet another reason for saying yes. And it is because I learned that Heather Gerken is the first woman to be dean, in addition to being um, the first tall dean in some years. <laughs> and, <laughs> And I wanted to come and sprinkle gold dust on her path to signify my delight and my disappointed surprise. Because I just assumed that Yale Law School should have had a woman dean earlier than now. But, 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 then, but then I remembered that Yale College only started admitting women in 1969. 1969. I have a dress my mother owned in 1969. It's in perfect shape and it doesn't even have that musty smell of thrift shop finds. 1969 is not that long ago, which I suppose says something about Yale, but please don't ask me what it says. I'm always happy to be back at Yale, happier than I ever was when I was an actual graduate student here. <laughs> but it really wasn't Yale's fault, even though the first winter I experienced my eyelashes freeze was here in New Haven. It was rather that I longed to write historical fiction, to bring alive the facts of the past, and I felt constrained by the demands of academic writing. And so it wasn't a good fit. I hope your experience has been different, has felt like a good fit. But even if it didn't, you have a degree from the best law school in the bloody country, and I think that is a reason for gratitude. One of the consequences of a fancy education in this country is the embrace of a certain kind of irony, which can sometimes feel like a hollow shield behind which we hide the vulnerable truths of who we are. 
And so I will briefly put down my shield, because I'm guilty of it as well, to say with an unapologetic earnestness that I know many of you came here with idealistic dreams, and I hope you still hold those dreams close. And I hope you know that idealism versus realism is a false choice. And I hope you continue to refuse to accept that unacceptable things must remain as they are. I, I am both idealistic and practical, and I believe we must dream. We visualize the world we want, and then, small brick by small brick, we try to build it. You can wrest justice from an American criminal justice system that is often unjust. You can give back dignity to those dispossessed. You can undo, in no matter how small a way, a legal system that continues to accord value on the basis of how much money you have, the color of your skin, who you love, where you pray. You can have that beautiful but unfulfilled ideal of equal justice under law as the propelling force of your life's work. But what we need in addition to law is love. And I say this too with an irony-free earnestness. In one of the most beautiful languages in the world, Igbo, the word for love is ifunanya, and the literal translation is to see someone. We have to see one another better. We must think more in collective terms because this savage individualism will not serve us. I, I, I was recently telling a friend that I, would, that I would be speaking here to brilliant people who have been taught by the best legal scholars and that I wasn't sure I had anything useful to say. And my friend replied, just don't be political. <laughs> Maybe my friend meant, don't do your usual tired rant about how American politics has become so simplistic in its division, so elementary in its tribalism, that it flies in the face of what we know to be true that one tribe cannot always be right and the other tribe always wrong. Or maybe my friend meant, don't ask the students what it feels like to be graduating from the same law school that gave us that recently leaked draft opinion which argues, astonishingly, that my female body is not really mine. My friend meant well, but I could not help but bristle at that advice, don't be political. Because sometimes what we call politics are actually the things we deeply value, the things that give meaning to our lives. And maybe being honest about our politics can present the opportunity for healthy debate. And by healthy debate, of course, I mean the opportunity to convince the other side that you are right and that they are evil. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> it says something about the state of our discourse today that I feel the need to clarify that. And so, as you go forth, whether you sail away to a Supreme Court clerkship, because apparently this is a pipeline to that, or, or to a law firm, or to community work, or to academia, or politics, I want to gently recommend this to you. Please do not be nice. Be kind, because kindness is a measure of our humanity. But do not be nice. Nice means wanting always to be liked. And this is a particular affliction of female socialization. Nice means silencing inconvenient truths. Nice means choosing always to be comfortable. Nice means letting go of courage. Nice means talking about peace, but not about justice. 
Nice will not remake the world, and there is so much about our world that needs remaking. And having this degree means you can remake the world if you choose to, because laws do not fall from the sky. Laws are made and interpreted by people, people like you. And while you bravely remake the world, please be skeptical of perfection, because perfection is, among other things, utterly boring. I am convinced of this because I have learned from literature that there is no such thing as a perfect human being. The longing for perfection will hold you back. It doesn't help any cause to start with perfection as yardstick. We do not need to be perfect before we are able to do what is right. I think of literature as my religion, and by far the greatest lesson I have learned is how we are more alike than not. I would read a novel, and in a few lines, or in a character description, I would feel a sudden internal shiver, that beautiful shock of mutuality, a sense of wonder that a writer born 100 years ago, or born in a white body, or born in a male body, or born into a culture so removed from mine, had so perfectly articulated exactly what I felt and made me feel less alone in a vast world. I say this not merely to plug novels, because I cannot help myself, but also because, as the wonderful Alice McDermott put it, we read novels to be able to live multiple lives. And it seems to me that lawyers probably need that more than most. I mean the multiple lives bit. <laughs> but really, it matters that we remember, actively remember, that we are universally human. That we may show love differently, but we all love. That what matters to us may differ, but we all want to matter. That we should extend grace as much as we expect grace that dignity is always as important as bread. Finally, I hope you enjoy today. I wonder how you're feeling, each one of you. How are you? So maybe you feel happiness, or something like happiness. Maybe your happiness was fleeting. Maybe a darkness descended like a shroud on your mood this morning. Maybe you're already questioning your law school decision. <laughs> Seems to have struck a chord. <laughs> Maybe you worry that you're not feeling what you're supposed to feel. Because the truth is that during life's major transitions, our feelings are often shaded, often nuanced, often complicated which makes me think of what seems to be an enduring peril of our times, this epidemic of unfulfillment, this feeling that something is missing. And so it leads us to think, just one more thing, and then I'll be happy. But the happiness is now, or at least the happiness potential is now. The world is a multifaceted place, imperfect but beautiful full of friendships waiting to be formed, ideas waiting to be explored, experiences waiting to be had, good deeds waiting to be done. It helps to make peace with uncertainty, to learn to live with uncertainty. It helps, too, to know that nobody is ever as together as they seem. I know all of you are type A, perfectly clever, perfectly brilliant people who have your SHIT together. <laughs> but you also all have issues, because we all have issues. And maybe it's time to reframe that incredibly American idea of the pursuit of happiness, so that perhaps we might seek in life not so much happiness as meaning, because then meaning will, should, bring happiness. So I wish you a future filled with meaning. I wish you everything you wish for yourself, 
that causes no harm to others. Congratulations. I'm a king, yes, I'm a king, go at think I'm a king, go king.